Uh, welcome to the lecture on probability and statistics. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about some introduction to the concept of statistics and probability. In the first chapter, we are going to have the introduction to statistics and the relationship between statistics and probability. The first part that we are going to talk about is the overview on statistical inference, samples, populations, and the role of probability. Let's talk about statistical method. In fact, statistical method have been used in all areas, including industry. So if we wanted to uh, manufacture some product, for example, like smartphone, statistical methods are essential. Statistics aims at handling uncertainty and variation in data. So we have to focus on this concept of variation which is the reason why we needed to study statistics. So, in other words, if there is no variation, we don't need to study statistics. So, let's take a look at some of the examples of variation uh, in many different situations. Um, for example, let's consider the situation that we are going to measure something. So, in this case, we normally have two questions. The first question, does the measured value match with the true value? Because nobody knows the true value and the way to um, get information on the true value is the measurement. But there is a variation in the measurement. Another question that we, that we may have is, do the measured values change every time? It may be true. So, it may be true. So, uh, we also have to consider the variations among the measurement. Let's consider another example, the effect of new medicine. So, when scientists develop a new medicine, they definitely test, but the problem is uh, there are variations in the effect of this medicine. So, for example, if some scientist get the treatment ratio of a new medicine of 85%, it is really questionable that it can be reproducible. So. Uh, this is another example of the variations in the data. At this point, uh, we are going to study the definitions of some important terms in statistics. The first term is the variable, which is a characteristic that changes or varies over time and or for different individuals or objects under consideration. So variable means it can change or it can vary. Uh, another one that we also have to study is the experimental units, which are items or objects on which measurements are taken. So what is the measurement? Measurement result when a variable is actually measured on an experimental unit. So we have this experimental unit and we have uh, items and we have so we measure something and we can have these variables. So that's the relationship among variable, experimental units, and measurement. 
we also have two more important concepts. The first one is the population, which is the whole set of all possible measurements. So if you measure millions, uh, uh, million times, so this uh, million measured data is the whole population in this case. On the other hand, if you select only 10 of these measured data, that's a subset of the population, and this is called a sample. When we look back the history of statistics, the term statistics is ultimately derived from the new Latin word statisticum gregium, which means the council of state, and the Italian word statistica, which means statement or politician. And there are other stories about the history of the um, statistics. Uh, but the, pr uh, the first time when people s started using the term of statistics was the 1791 uh, in England. And at that time, Sir Sinclair first published the book uh, titled Statistical Account of Scotland. And that's actually the first time people started using the word statistics. Uh, we are talking about statistical method. In fact, there are two types of different uh, statistical methods. The first one is descriptive statistics, and the second one is inferential statistics. And uh, later, we are going to study a little bit more about them. But at this point, let's have some brief introduction. And let's just try to uh, understand this concept. So assuming that we have a population, and assuming that we wanted to know the properties of the population. For example, um, we may be interested in average income or population of a group. Then maybe that can uh, become a population in this statistical analysis. And there are two ways that we can get information from this population. One of them is sampling. That means we just get a subset of this population and analyze them. The other one is census. We examine each individual element in this population. But anyway, uh, by doing either sampling or census, we can get some data. And we can get a summary of data which can be done by doing descriptive statistics. So we can have some numbers or some properties. And once you get that, what you have to do is, if you get a sample uh, from this population, and by analyzing this sample, uh, our final purpose is to get an information on this population. So from the summary of data in the sample, we wanted to get an information uh, in this population. And for th this step, for this purpose, we needed to infer something. And this is, uh, this is called the inferential statistics. So that's the difference between the uh, descriptive and inferential statistics. Uh, the purpose of descriptive statistics is to summarize or describe the data. And of course, the purpose of the inferential statistics is to infer something from a limited information. So uh, we are talking about statistics, and the question is, what is the role of probability when we talk about the statistics? In fact, 
the answer is uh, probability is an essential tool and language for statistics. In fact, if there is no probability theory, there is no statistical uh, the analysis. So the concept of probability is inevitable for collecting samples and doing statistical inference. So in our case, we always deal with the population and sample and from population to sample or from sample to population, we need to do something and that steps are called the statistical method. And when we wanted to get an information from a population to get a sample, probability is essential. We have to consider probability when we when we get on when we get a sample. Um, on the other hand, when we wanted to infer the population from uh, the data in the sample, we have to do the statistical inference. And in this case, again, the probability theory is very important. So in summary, probability is really needed for the statistical analysis. And this is why we first have to study the probability. And then we will move on to talk about the statistics. We now have the first example that is about the probability and statistical inference. And from this example, we'll see why the probability is important in this kind of statistical analysis. So in this example, we are considering a manufacturing process uh, that produce some um, devices. So this device or this item, maybe smartphone or watches or television or something like that. Anyway, um, when we get 100 items and we found that 10 are found to be defective. Obviously, these 100 items represent a sample because this manufacturing pro may produce more than millions of items per day and 100 items are, are just, this, is, this represents a small subset of the whole population. And so this is the sample. And from this information, we wanted to know how much defective uh, items are included in the population. And our target is we wanted to have the maximum defective ratio of 5%. We cannot tolerate the more than 5% defective ratio in this process. So in summary, the situation is we have 100 items and we found 10% defective ratio but in the population we only wanted to have the defective ratio less than 5% so the question is if we only have 5% of the defective ratio, what is the probability that we can get 10% of the defective ratio in, this, in a sample? If this probability is too small, it's unlikely to happen, which means the initial assumption that this defective ratio of the population is 5% is wrong. So um, this probability is really important. So we, we, by examining this probability, 
we can actually know the information on this population. So the element of the population uh, probability allows the engineer to determine how conclusive the sample information is regarding the nature of the process. In fact, uh, we have to study more to calculate the actual population in this example. So at this point, let's just accept the probability value uh, for this example. In this case, the population conceptually represent all possible items from the process. Suppose we learn that if the process is acceptable, that is, if it does produce items no more than 5% of which are defective, there is a probability of only like 0.0282 of obtaining 10 or more defective items uh, in a random sample of 100 items from this process. So that's the probability that we, we originally have 5% of the, 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 the uh, defection ratio and we have 10% of the defection ratio in the sample with the size of 10, 100. This is one probability suggests that the process does indeed have a long run rate of defective items that exceed 5%. It's wrong. It cannot be 5%. If it is 5% uh, in the population, the chance to get this kind of sample is too small. So we cannot accept that. So in other words, under the condition of an acceptable process, the sample information obtained would rarely occur, however it did occur. Clearly, it would occur with a higher probability if the process defective rate exceeds 5% by a significant amount. Let's consider another example, and in this case, uh, we are going to consider the probability and statistical inference. So in this case, uh, we wanted to examine the effect of nitrogen on the growth of plant. So we are comparing two groups. The first group of the plants were treated, uh, was pr treated uh, without nitrogen, and the second group was treated by the nitrogen. Uh, if this nitrogen has some effect on the growth of the plants, the two groups should have significant difference. In fact, um, if you look at each number, um, they have variations. So it is not really easy to compare two groups. For example, if you compare the first set of data, um, the growth rate of a plant without nitrogen is even higher than, than the plant growth rate of the plant with the nitrogen. But if you compare other data set, for example, like this one, like this one, obviously the plant uh, with the nitrogen treat, uh, treatment shows a higher growth rate. So sometimes it is better to represent the data in a graph, as you can see on this slide. So in this case, we plotted the growth rate without the nitrogen treatment and with the nitrogen treatment. So uh, um, it looks like the nitrogen has some effect. But if we want to quantitatively analyze, we have to calculate the probability. We have to use the probability to have the final conclusion. The next part of this chapter is about the sampling 
procedures and the collection of data. When you consider the implementation of the sampling, what you have to remember, uh, the most important thing is, you always have to guarantee the simple random sampling. Uh, without random sampling, all the analysis is really meaningless, so you always have to be careful to get a random sample. So simple random sampling is the most important thing, and a, simple, uh, a sampling method where the probability to select a certain sample is the same, in this case, we can call that this is a simple random sampling. Use of a random number table or other tools may be um, useful to get a random sample. So by doing that, we can avoid biased samples. So um, that's important because when the samples are biased, these samples may be really uh, meaningless. And only random samples can represent the population. And so, for example, if you have a biased sample for opinion polls, for presidential election, the result of the statistical analysis or statistical inference may be really um, incorrect or misleading. Sometimes it is really challenging to have a random sample, so there are techniques such as uh, uh, stratified sampling, and in this case we can um, uh, make uh, several groups inside the population, and we can get a certain ratio in each group, and so that we can um, actually have a way to get, we can actually have a uh, um, a better chance to get a random sample. This slide shows an example of random number table, which is uh, useful to get a random sample. In the history of statistical analysis, uh, there are some examples of biased sample um, one of the well-known example is the case of Literary Digest, which is the best remembered today for the circumstances surrounding its demise. So, um, before 1936, uh, the Literary Digest had always correctly predicted the winner of the presidential election, and in 1936 uh, fall showed that the Rep Republican candidate was likely to be the overwhelming winner uh, in this presidential election, according to this the um, opinion for by the uh, literary digest. Obviously, it was wrong, and the result was opposite, and people uh, study the reason why this opinion for was wrong and the conclusion was the sample was highly biased so the information from that sample uh, was not really useful and that's one of the, uh, uh, the example that uh, emphasized the importance of random sample. Let's talk about the concept of experiment design. Uh, in this case, we need to have a structured method to know the effect of treatment. So, uh, when we consider the nitrogen effect or placebo effect, we always have to know the reason of getting variations. In fact, variation is analyzed by two terms. One of them is the variation by treatment, and the other one is the variation by accident. So in the previous example of the uh, nitrogen effect, 
we actually see the data the have we see that the data have have the variation caused by this the nitrogen treatment and the accident experimental method are designed to have uniform variation in the group so we can we need to have a random allocation blocking or something like that to separate the effect of this treatment from the effect of the variation uh, let's take a look at this example a corrosion study was made in order to determine whether coating on aluminum metal with a corrosion retardation substance reduce the the reduce the amount of corrosion so in this case this is an untreated aluminum metal and this is on a treated aluminum metal with the corrosion retardation so we change the conditions and we examine the corrosion ratio the coating is a protectant that is advertised to minimize fatigue damage in uh, in this type of material also of interest is the influence of humidity on the on the amount of corrosion so we wanted to examine two things the first thing is the effect of coating and the second thing is the effect of humidity so in this exa example we have two variables so we need to design the experiment to examine the effect of coating and the effect of humidity so two levels of coating no coating and chemical corrosion coating were used in addition two relative humidity levels are 20% relative humidity and 80% relative humidity and we measure the uh, the cycles thousands of cycles to failure so this actually uh, shows the result in a graph so as you can see if you treat the the aluminum with a, a corrosion coating it has higher uh, cycles which means it has the resistance against the corrosion and compared with this case we can see that this matter without the treatment shows um, a more corrosion tendency and if you compare the effect of humidity of course if you increase the humidity the corrosion the uh, tendency increases so the cycle uh, decreases so uh, we can uh, now confirm the effect of coating and effect of the humidity so in this example uh, we can um, actually see how we can design the effect of two factors in this section uh, we are going to consider the types of data one of them is the discrete data and uh, the other one is continuous data so continuous data in this picture a violin um, is type kind of the uh, instrument that has the continuous uh, music that can create continuous music on the other hand if you look at the piano it's the music that can uh, create is discrete so just like the case with the violin and piano data has two types including the 
discrete type and continuous type. So there are two kinds of quantitative data. One of them is discrete and the, the other one is continuous. So discrete data are countable. So for example, number of people, number of defective products, they are continuous data, uh, the discrete data. On the other hand, continuous data are non-countable, so weight, height, ratio of defective products are the examples of the continuous data. In addition to this type, well, one, of, one of the special type of the data is the binary data. Of course, uh, this is uh, uh, discrete data, but we only have two kinds of result, 0 or 1, yes or no. So this is this binary data is used to calculate the sample ratio. Let's move on to talk about the probability and we are also going to study the concept of sample space and events. Again, we have to study the the definitions and terms. So, um, the for first of the statistical experiments is to create data. That's actually the for first. So, if you toss a dice, uh, you can get the answer. If you measure a weight, you can also get the answer. So as a result of this kind of experiment, we can get the result, which is the data. So uh, in this case, what is the sample space? The set of all possible outcomes of a statistical experiment is called the sample space. So and this is represented by the symbol capital S. So for example, if you toss the dice, we have um, numbers and the all possible numbers, all possible outcomes by tossing a dice is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which is the sample space for this experiment. And sample points or element indicates each result of sample space. So if you toss a dice and if you get the number of three, which is a sample point, and if you <laughs> um, uh, if you have all possible outcomes, that's the sample space. So in this example, we can see how we can uh, define the sample space even uh, from a, from a uh, same experiment. So consider the experiment of tossing a dice. So we are going to toss a dice, something like that. If we are interested in the number that shows on the top space, the sample space is, as I already mentioned, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's the sample space. However, if we are interested in only whether the number is even or odd, so for example, if you get the number 2, in this case, this is simply uh, the, the even number, and if you get the number of a five, this is the odd num this is the odd number. So in this case, whatever you get the number, the all possible outcomes from this experiment is either even or odd. So uh, this means that sample space may be different even in same experiments depending on the interest. So if you are interested in the numbers 
we have this kind of sample space but if you are interested in the type of numbers in this case we are going to have a different sample space sometimes you may need to repeat the experiment and you also need to consider all possible outcomes from a set of experiments in this case we need to develop a special technique to consider all possible outcomes one of them is the tree diagram so let's study the tree diagram together with this example suppose that three items are selected at a random from a manufacturing process so we will have three items from a manufacturing systems so for example this um, item may be on smartphone maybe a smartphone or television or something like that but anyway we are going to have three items and we will examine to find whether this item is defective or non-defective so it is if it is defective we can simply denote it as uh, capital D and if it, it is non-defective we will simply denote this item as capital N so if you examine three items the sample space or the all possible outcomes uh, from this test uh, will be just like that so ddd tdn something like that so um that means <laughs> we needed to have a technique to count all possible uh, outcomes so uh, one of the way is to start uh, one by one so uh, we first examine the first item so there are two possibilities D or N and then we move on to examine the second item in this case again we'll have two possible outcomes in each case so D and D N and in the uh, third item again we'll have two possible uh, outcomes uh, the outcomes in each case so that by drawing this kind of tree diagram we can consider uh, all possible outcomes without missing anything so this is the way that we can use tree diagram to create a sample space sample space with a large or infinite number of sample points are best described by a statement or rule method so this is an example of a statement that defines the sample space and this is an example of defining a sample space by using a rule method another important concept that you have to study at this point is the event an event is a subset of a sample space so if you have a sample space and if you select a part of this uh, sample space that is an event so for example in this case example given the sample space s equal t uh, t is equal or larger than zero uh, where t is the life of in ear of a certain electronic component then the event a that the component fails before the end of the uh, the fifth ear is the subset a which is uh, t t is uh, between zero and five so um, 
obviously this is the sample space and this is an event. It is conceivable that an event may be a subset that includes the entire uh, sample space or a subset of S called the null set and denoted by the symbol pi, which contains no elements at all. For instance, if we let A be the event of determining a microscopic organism with the naked eye in a biological experiment, then A equals pi. Let's consider the relationship between the sample space and the event. In this case, one of the description of this uh, relationship is the complement. The complement of an event A with respect to S is the subset of all elements of S that is not in A. So in this case, we denote the complement A by the symbol A dash. So um, let R be the event that a uh, red card is selected from an ordinary deck of 52 playing cards and let S be the entire deck and in this case R dash is the event that the card selected from the deck is not a red card but a black card. So another example here is Consider the sample space S equal book, cell phone, MP3, paper, stationery, and laptop. And if you let A as book, stationery, laptop, and paper, and obviously in this case the complement the complement of A is cell phone and MP3. Another relationship uh, regarding this is the intersection. The intersection of two events A and B denoted by the um, symbol A uh, intersection B is the event containing all elements that are common to A and B. So um, again, let's uh, Consider this example. Let E be the event that a person selected at random in a classroom is majoring in engineering. And let F be the event that the uh, person is female. So in this case, the intersection of A, E and F is the event of all engineering students in this classroom. So this intersection means this student has a major of engineering and this student is a female. We studied the uh, intersection and we also studied the uh, null event and with that we can also consider a special relationship which is uh, mutually exclusive or disjoint. So, two if, if we have two events and uh, when the intersection of A and B equals a null event and in, it means that A and B have no elements in common. So in this case we can say that Two events A and B are mutually exclusive or disjoint. So there are no common elements in these in these two events. So um, it is clear uh, by um, understanding this example, a cable television company offers programs on eight 
different channels, uh, three of which are affiliated with ABC, which is a well-known television company in the United States, two with NBC, also a very um, famous uh, uh, this broadcasting company, and one with CBS. The other two are on the educational channel and ESPN sports channel. Suppose that a person su uh, subscribing to this service turns on a TV set without first selecting the channel. Let A be the event that the program belongs to the NBC network and B the event that it belongs to the CBS network. Um, such a television program cannot belong to more than one network, so the event A and B have no program in common because two companies, they don't have any common uh, TV programs. Therefore, the intersection A of A and B contains no programs and consequently, the events A and B are mutually exclusive or disjoint. Another uh, relationship uh, between two events is a union. The union is the two events A and B denoted by the symbol A uh, union B is the event containing all elements that belong to A or B or both. So uh, we can simply understand that by looking at this example. So let A equals ABC and let B equals BCDE. And in this case, the, the union of A and B equals ABCDE. So ABC and B, C, D, E. The other two examples are so easy, so I will not uh, explain anymore. So uh, we studied uh, intersection and we also studied uh, union and one of the way to visually show the this kind of relationship is to draw Venn diagrams. So this is uh, how Venn diagrams look like. So first we have to define the sample space, which is um, general, in most cases, shown as a rectangular. And when you have event, you can draw a circle and if you have the two events uh, and if they have intersections we can draw like that so this should be the intersection of two events and if you wanted to show the union you can just draw like that so that implies the union of two events. So in this example, so in this case, um, and if A is the A is the case that the card is red, and if B is the case that the card is the jack, king, or king of diamond, and if the if C is the case that the card is an ace, uh, we have um, intersections and unions in, uh, in each case. And there are also uh, some special cases. Uh, for example, if you uh, wanted to get the intersection of A and a uh, null event, the result is the null event. And if you, uh, if you uh, wanted to get 
the union of A and uh, null event. The result is the uh, the event A. So there are several cases, uh, there are several special cases that you have to remember, and it's very obvious once you can draw the Venn diagram and you can understand the relationship. For example, the, com the complement of sample space is a null event, and the complement of a null event is the sample space. And the complement uh, uh, and the intersection um, of and the complement of the intersection of A and B equals the union of complement A and complement B and the complement of the 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 A the union of A and B equals the the intersection of complement A and complement B. By the way, the Venn diagram was first introduced by Mr. John Van um, as um, as shown on this slide. People say that the Baduk is a very difficult game because there are too many possible cases. In fact, uh, the scientists um, try to calculate all possible cases in Badu. So, in fact, this is a huge number. So, there are almost 10 to 171 cases uh, in Badu, which is actually the number of elements in the sample space for Badu. So, it is amazing that this the artificial intelligence such as AlphaGo uh, can beat the the uh, human players because uh, it means that this computer program can consider uh, these kinds of uh, many cases and it actually uh, can uh, beat the human beings. Again, in this case, um, uh, people try to introduce uh, some statistical method to simplify the calculations, and this is why this computer program can have a better performance, better intelligence than the human players uh, in the case of Baduk game. We studied uh, uh, tree diagram to count sample points, but in fact, in some cases, it is too complex to draw a tree diagram. So in this case, we needed to have a special technique to calculate or count the sample point. So we are going to study several techniques and in this section. The first method is the permutation. A permutation is an arrangement of all or part of a set of objects. Consider the three letters A and B, A, B, and C. The possible permutations are ABC, ACV, BAC, BCA, and CAV, and CBA. So um, there are six distinct arrangements in this case. In fact, of course, we can draw a tree diagram to count all elements uh, in this sample space. However, um, one of the, the formula that can uh, calculate this arrangement is this one. So the number of permutation of n object is n factorial. So in this case, we have four elements, and even uh, without 
considering all the cases, we can simply calculate in this case. So uh, in the previous example, we have three um, letters. So the number of permutations is three factorial, which is three, uh, two, one, so six. And if you have four letters in this case, for uh, the number of permutations is the four factorial, which is uh, 24. Sometimes we don't need to select all object from a certain group. So in this case, uh, we also have to consider a permutation. So the number of permutations of n distinct object taken r at a time equals uh, n p r and this can be calculated by having a ratio of n factorial to n minus n, n minus r factorial. So <coughs> in this example, uh, um, in one year, three hours will be given to a class of 25 graduate students in a statistical department. If each student can receive at most one reward, how many possible selections are there? So in this case, the total number of students is 25, but we only have three awards. So among 25, we have to select three. So that means it's uh, 25P3. So the way of calculation is 25 factorial, 25 minus 3 factorial. So that should be this one. And it should be simply 25 multiplied by 24 multiplied by 23. So it's uh, 1300, uh, 13,800. This is another example that is interesting. So let's take a look at this together. So a president and a treasurer uh, are to be chosen from a student club consisting of uh, 50 people. And how many different choices of officers are possible if there is no restrictions? In this case, it's very simple because um, it's just the cases that we select two positions from 50 students, 50 people. So it's 50 P2, which is uh, 20, uh, 50 multiply by uh, 49. The second case is a little bit tricky and in this case the, uh, the condition is the student A will serve only if he is, uh, um, is the president which means that if he is selected as the president there are 95 possibilities that uh, a treasurer, uh, a treasurer is selected from the remaining student, st uh, remaining people, and there is another case that A is not selected as the president, so he will give up, and we have to select uh, um, two positions from. 90, uh, 49 uh, people, so that should be this one. So we will have some number. The other two cases are also interesting, so please uh, look at them and try to solve by yourself. And these are the answers for the previous uh, problems. There are uh, certain variations of the permutation. One of them is the circular permutation. The number of permutation of n object arranged in a circular is n minus 1 factorial. 
So, for example, if poor people are playing bridge, we do not have a new permutation if they all move one position in a clockwise direction. By considering one person in a fixed position and, and arranging the other three in three factorial ways, we find that there are six distinct arrangements for the bridge game. Another variation that we have to consider is the case that we have same object. The number of distinct permutations of n things of which n1 is are of one kind and two of a second kind blah 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 and nk is a case kind is this one so in this case we have um, several objects uh, uh, which are same so for example we have three uh, red balls and three black balls or three blue balls, something like that. So in this case, we needed to apply this formula. So um, let's take a look at this example. Uh, in a college football training session, the defensive coordinator needed to have 10 players standing in a row. Among these 10 players, there are one freshman, two sophomores, four juniors and three seniors. So um, uh, we regard them um, as the same object or same people in this case. So in, uh, how many different ways can they be arranged in a row if only their class level will be distinguishable. So we do not uh, distinguish individual, we only consider the class level. So in this case, uh, simply we apply this equation. So 10 factorial divided by the product of 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 4 factorial, and, and 3 factorial, which corresponded to uh, 12,600. Another variation is the partition. The number of ways of partitioning a set of n objects into r cells with n1 elements in the first cell, n2 elements in the second, and so forth is this one. So we use this kind of um, uh, uh, notations, and the way of calculation is to have the ratio of n factorial to the product of the factorials of each object. So um, this is the case uh, where we wanted to assign several uh, objects or several people into uh, several rooms or several spaces. So uh, as you can see the, in this example, uh, if we wanted to assign seven students in uh, three rooms uh, with different the accommodations, so one triple uh, room and two double rooms. In this case, we have three rooms. One room can contain, um, can accommodate uh, three students. The other second room can have two students, and the third room can um, take uh, two students. So in this case, um, seven factorial, three factorial, two factorial, and two factorial, which is uh, 210. So we started the permutation, which is uh, uh, a way of arranging the object. Sometimes um, we do not need to consider the 
order of the object. In this case, instead of permutation, we needed to have uh, another uh, way of selecting the object, which is called the combination. The number of combinations of n distinct object taken r at a time is uh, this one, and uh, n c r, which is n factorial divided by r factorial, and n minus r factorial. So in this case, uh, we do not distinguish it the uh, 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 selection order. So whatever we select, it's the same. So um, in this example, a young boy asks his mother to get five Game Boy cartridges from his uh, collection of 10 arcade and five sports game cartridges. And so the question is, how many ways are there that his mother can get three arcade and two sports game cartridge. So we have 10 arcade game and we have five sports game and we'll select three arcade games among 10 and we'll select five, uh, two sports game among five. So we am uh, once you select, it's not important uh, that uh, the uh, it's not important to consider the arrangement. So we only select, and that's all. So the first uh, combinations is ten C three, which is one hundred and twenty, and the second combination is. 5c2 which is 10 so um, by multiplying two combinations we can get um, 1200 ways another interesting example that we have here is how many different letter arrangement can be made from the letters in the word statistics so in this case, um, um, we have 3s and we have 3t and we have 2i and we have 1a and we have 1c. So using the same argument as the discussion uh, in the previous theorem, uh, in this example, we can actually apply this theorem to obtain uh, this. So, among 10 objects, we wanted to have the combinations for these five letters, and that's this number. Here, we have 10 total letters with two letters appearing three times each, letter I appearing twice, and the letter A and C appearing once each, or the result can be obtained directly by using another theorem, which was shown in the previous slide. The next section is about the probability of an um, event. So uh, in the history of the probability theory, um, there have been several mathematicians uh, who developed this kind of theory. So the probability of dice game was developed by Pascal and Perma. And the probability theory, the modern probability theory was established by Kolmogorov. So uh, the thing that we are studying are based on their work. So let's define the probability. The probability of an event A is the sum of the weights of all sample points in A. 
Therefore, we can uh, write down this kind of equation. Or, so, the probability A for the PA, the probability of an event A or PA is in between 0 and 1, and a probability for a null event equals 0, and probability for the sample space equals 1. Furthermore, if we have the uh, several uh, events which are mutually exclusive, in this case, if you have a union for all these uh, mutually exclusive events, uh, we can calculate this by adding the probability for each event. So as you can see in this example, this kind of um, uh, relationship can be uh, very useful. So in this example, a coin is tossed twice and we want to have, uh, we want to know the probability that uh, at least one had occurs. So the first thing that you have to do is to get the sample space. So how many possible outcomes that we can have? And then we have to get the sample space that uh, satisfy this condition. So um, the sample space is uh, the number of these elements in this sample space is 4 because uh, we have the elements like H, 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 T, T, H, and T, T. And the sample space, uh, the, e the event that satisfies this condition is H, 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 T, and T, H. And in this case, uh, all three uh, events are mutually exclusive. So um, this PA, it may be just like uh, this, or we can add the probability for each event. And this is one force, this is one force, this is one force. In this case, we are going to consider the case of tossing a uh, dice. So this is dice. So, and in this case, uh, uh, we will consider a uh, special dice. Uh, this dice is loaded in a in such a way that an even number is twice as likely to occur as an odd number. So this is not a fair dice. Fair dice means that each number has the same chance to appear. But in this case, we have a higher chance to uh, have the even number than the odd number. So this is not a fair dice. So this is, is a special case. If E is the event that a number less than 4 occurs on a single toss of, the, of, of this dice, and we want to find PE. So in this case, the sample space is uh, sample space S is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. However, we have different probability in each case. So P1 equals 1 ninth, but P2 equals 2 ninths. And P3 equals 1 ninth and phi. So uh, 
we wanted to have the case that we have the number 1 to 3. So by adding these, these three probability values, so we'll get this answer. If an experiment can result in any one of n different equally likely outcomes, and if exactly n of these outcomes correspond to event A, then the probability of event A is simply expressed as the ratio of n to capital N. So, just like the case of tossing a pair dice, in this case, uh, S equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And in each case, uh, the probability should be same. And if we A is 1, 2, 3, in this case, the number of the, uh, the element for the small n equal in, in this case is 3 and large capital N equals 6. So the probability A in this case is simply uh, 3, 6, and it is this one in this case. Uh, in this example, we are going to select uh, some student uh, from a classroom. Uh, which has um, uh, 25 students from an industrial from the industrial engineering department, 10 students from the mechanical engineering department, and 10 students from the uh, the electrical engineering department, and a student from the civil engineering department. And so we are going to select one person. Uh, we are going to select randomly. So, and um, in this case, we wanted to calculate the probability that this student is uh, belongs to an industrial engineering department or a civil engineering department or the civil engineering department. So. Total number of students in this case is 55, uh, 50, uh, 53, and the number of the student in the uh, uh, industrial engineering department in this case is 25. So the probability that we select the student from the uh, uh, belonging to the industrial depa engineering department is 25 di divided by uh, 53. And uh, in the second case, uh, if we select a student and if this student belongs to either the civil engineering department or the electrical engineering department in this case, uh, so it actually Uh, it can be expressed like this. So PC equals um, 8 divided by 53, and PE is actually 10 divided by 53. So the answer is uh, 1853rd. In this slide, there is a link uh, that you can watch the YouTube 